Hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of Pilot Points. I'm Jim Duvall, president of CA View Companies. I was a sim instructor for a number of years and wrote the book Aircraft Performance Myths and Methods. As you might suspect, I engage quite a few pilots in the discussion of aircraft performance at sim centers, online forums, pilot lounges, YouTube, and of course through Pilot Points. So today I thought you'd be interested in a detailed, logical look at a couple of the most common positions held by runway analysis advocates. In fact, these are likely the same statements you hear in recurrent class. In the form of actual quotes I've received, allow me to state their positions. Quote, I'm going to stick with runway analysis. It's much safer and every obstacle is taken into account. Or this one, runway analysis works great. It allows us to take our Hawker 800 XP out of Minden, Nevada at gross weight on a 20C day. Very easy to use. So there you have it. It's safer, clears every obstacle, simply works to part heavier. That by far is the biggest issue I hear. And it's easy to use. Now, since it was brought up, I'm going to use the Minden departure. This same individual touted it as a very simple, straightforward, special procedure, not one of those really difficult ones that require an extensive training and preparation. Read what the departure procedure says. Climb straight ahead to IB Wick, climb in the holding pattern, and the hold is described below. Couldn't be simpler, right? Well, what I intend to do here is reverse engineer the answer so that we can create a real depiction of the procedure and put to the test these four positions. Since we know the field elevation, temperature, and the takeoff weight that is calculated from the runway analysis output, we can use the AFM for the type of aircraft to see exactly the climb performance to expect. Entering the second segment chart for flap zero, 20 degrees Celsius, and up to 4,700 feet, then move over to the reference line of the weight graph and down to the calculated weight of 28,000 pounds. This particular chart utilizes a mirror or bumper bar. That reflects onto the wind component chart. Since we're not using any wind, the resulting climb gradient is 1.5%. Since the chart is in net, I'll put a circle around that so you can see where I get that. I'll add back in the 0.8% that gives us a 2.3% gross climb gradient, which is 140 feet per nautical mile. Keep in mind that this doesn't even meet the standard 200 feet per nautical mile or a 3.3% climb gradient. So right off the bat, we see a problem formulating. Now in all fairness, most runway analysis calculations will somewhere state that the max weight climb limit isn't being met. But in every case I've seen, where this happens, not a single pilot I've questioned has any idea of what this means and certainly didn't dissuade the pilot quoted here. Also, there are no V-speeds associated with the max weight climb values listed. This aircraft, as all aircraft do, has an engine time limit for maximum takeoff power. For this aircraft, that limit is five minutes. And keep in mind that those pilots flying aircraft with 10-minute engines may try to disconnect at this point, thinking that the example no longer applies to them. Nothing could be farther from the truth. The actual numbers may change, but the same fallacies of runway analysis will apply. At the time limit, the aircraft must be configured with a clean wing, speed at the V-final speed, and the power reduced to maximum continuous, or MCP. Continuing the second segment beyond the time limit is one of the most common and dangerous practices permeating Part 25 aircraft training. It's dangerous because you no longer have any data supporting your climb capability. The second segment values in the AFM presume the flight is still within the engine time limits and below or at the level off height. It should be common knowledge by now that published climb performance diminishes with time and altitude. That reduction in climb is factored into the data within the AFM, provided you are within the engine time limit and altitude envelope. The practice of maintaining V2 until clear of all obstacles, with no regard of how high or far away these obstacles are, is a dangerous practice to adopt. Unfortunately, it's still taught in many venues. It is quite literally ubiquitous. It is not let me repeat that, it is not an AFM-approved practice. 
Now back to our Hawker 800 XP. The runway analysis calculation provides a V2 speed of around 120 knots for this weight. Thus the aircraft is going approximately 2 miles per minute. IBWIC is 7.5 miles from the DER of the runway 34. So by the time the aircraft arrives at IBWIC, it will have exhausted its 5 minutes. From an AFM standpoint, the aircraft will need to immediately reduce power to MCP and then accelerate to VFTO while retracting any flaps. A side note, don't fall for the straw man argument that if I'm seeing trees in my windscreen, uh, I'm not going to pour back the power. Obviously, no one is arguing that point. The whole purpose of pre-flight planning is to eliminate the odds of ever seeing trees in your windshield. The distance required to accelerate from V2 to VFTO can only be calculated from the AFM if the power is at max takeoff. But since the power must be reduced prior to reaching VFTO in this scenario, there is no data available to precisely establish it. It's certainly longer than if max takeoff power was set. The FM tells us that it will take, with max power set, around 30,000 feet. It's almost 5 miles. We as pilots have no idea how long it will take at max continuous power. The importance of this will become obvious very shortly. The next question we must answer is how high will we be at IB WIC, the starting point of our hold? As previously stated, IB WIC is 7.5 nautical miles from the runway end. Therefore, the aircraft will have climbed 1,050 feet. That's 7.5 nautical miles times 140 feet per mile. Remember, it's high, hot, and heavy, and you have an engine out. So we now have enough information to build our animation. Oh, by the way, we can also calculate from the FM the radius of the turn, and the holding pattern size is depicted appropriately. First, an overview. The magenta color represents the holding pattern. Please note the terrain protruding up through the holding pattern along the outbound leg. Now, the ardent user of these procedures might say that the climb continues in the hold as per the instructions. And even if that were true, which we have already seen is in conflict with the procedure established in the FM for pre-flight planning, there's no data to quantify the climb uh, ability as we are outside the engine time limit envelope. And secondly, as you will see in the automation, too much altitude needs to be gained to clear the terrain. The animation demonstrates quite graphically how perilously close to obstacles the path is. So let's watch the video now. The speed has been increased to save time, but even at this fast pace, you get a sense of just how lumbering uh, is the climb. We are approaching IB Wick and starting the turn to the outbound leg of 163 degrees. Look at the train below you. All this is happening with an emergency in progress, maybe in marginal weather conditions. So let's come back to the quotes. It's much safer and every obstacle is taken into account. Does anyone actually believe that there's a database which contains every tree and antenna? Even the Air Force manually flies their IR and VR routes annually to confirm that no new obstacles have popped up. When I drove between Kansas and Oklahoma recently, I was amazed at how many antennas observable from the road were not charted on the sectional. There's actually nothing true about this statement. How about this one? The runway analysis works great. It allows us to take our Hawker 800 XP out of Minden, Nevada on a 20C a day at gross weight. Very easy to use. What is the fallacy of this statement? 
The pilot never flew the special departure procedure. His engine didn't fail. He's falsely assuming that the purpose of the special departure procedure is to fulfill some superficial requirement to dot the I's and cross the T's. He's not focused at all on his fiduciary responsibility to protect the aircraft, passengers, and crew in the case of an emergency. The second part for us performance engineers really makes the hair stick up on the back of our necks. A software application does not allow you to take off at one airport heavier than another application. The application does not suspend the laws of physics. The aircraft will perform as designed based on the temperature, altitude, and weight of the operation. However, this is said with such confidence by so many pilots that one wonders when meeting regulatory requirements or being competitive trumped safety. The last statement, it's easier to use. Well, if all he's doing is looking at the one value, not even looking at the other limitations, such as climb limit weight or adjustments, then perhaps he's right. It's very easy. Now, don't make the mistake of inferring that I don't think runway analysis has a place in our industry. It does, under these restrictions. One, the special procedures used by any one operator are limited to no more than two. Crews simply cannot train adequately for more than that. Not in the 135 or 91 world, anyway. The actual number is somewhat debatable, but in my experience, it must be a very small number. Number two, each procedure must be flight tested and or reviewed as we did here. Remember, most simulators lack the terrain detail required for obstacle avoidance at all but a few airports, so relying on simulators may not be an option. Number three, a training regiment must be established to assure a high degree of proficiency and currency in performing the procedure. Pilots should have a thorough understanding of exactly what safety margins they can count on and what will compromise those margins. And four, a standardized pre-flight brief and cockpit setup must be established. This includes a tested protocol in how the procedure will be flown. How will the FMS be set up? Will you hand fly the procedure? Are you going to unsync the FMSs? These types of questions. I personally came up with a 12 item briefing. Now one last point. People who subscribe to these procedures will often say after listening to this type of review, well we don't actually use the special procedures, we just use the normal departure procedure. I did not take the time to go into it here, but the normal departures as presented by runway analysis companies often fall victim to the same shortcomings as addressed here. Again, all of these procedures are simply mathematical models. They are not, and I repeat, not flight tested or approved departures, nor are they found in your FMS database. They must be manually entered and are therefore highly susceptible to erroneous entries. There are a number of other issues, like what the sensitivity is of the CDI in manually entered paths, is there a difference between Collins or Honeywell and Universal Systems? The answer to all these questions is yes, but I'll address these in another video soon. I hope this episode has been enlightening, and I hope you will sit down with your colleagues and discuss these issues openly. Until next time, thanks for watching.